A year ago, a DJ from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, began encouraging Americans to find a new homeland. Those who were fearful or angry about a potential President Trump could come find a simpler life on the island. Now, the Washington Post has traced some of the stories from those hoping to resettle. Chico Harlan joins me now with more. Good morning. Welcome to our program. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So what caught your attention about this story? You know, I was initially looking just to tell a story about an American who had moved or was planning to move to Canada uh, because of Trump's victory. And it was hard to find. So this story evolved. Eventually, I made enough phone calls, learned about this site, which, as it turns out, had been covered pretty extensively already, um, and, and certainly in Canada. And I started talking to this DJ who you mentioned he had received over the previous year about 5,000 emails from Americans. And I realized as I started hearing more about these Americans that more interesting wasn't whether people were moving, but the kind of emotions that were causing people to even consider leaving the United States, that feeling of alienation or feeling of, of sudden unfamiliarity with what was happening in your own country. Um, and so I sort of lost interest in the first question and became a lot more interested in this feeling that was happening in a not insignificant number of, of Americans' lives. Uh, and Cape Breton became the framework for that story. So tell us about some of the people that you met. And did anyone actually end up moving? Well, some people are in the process of at least seriously considering it. I didn't find any Americans that have yet moved to Cape Breton uh, because of, of Donald Trump. And I suspect that very few will do it. I mean, it's a huge deal to leave your own country. But I talked to uh, at least a dozen people over the phone or in person who had uh, written to this island and, and spent significant time with at least one husband and wife who were featured prominently in the story. They all were serious about it. Now, I would be interested to revisit those conversations which happened a month ago. I mean, the way things are in the US right now, the feelings about the political moment really evolve quickly and, and the kinds of evolutions you could have in your, in your own heart that used to go over years now seem to happen in days and weeks. Um, but everybody was serious. Everybody was, was feeling a lot of anxiety and, and nerves. And a, a large number of these people were not just living in liberal bubble uh, blue cities. They, were, they tended to be in more rural areas, surrounded by people who had different political feelings than they did. Do you think that anxiety about a potential President Trump still exists now that there is a President Trump? Well, sure. Um, and this is just speaking on behalf of the people that I talked to. Nothing that they've seen from him in his first couple of, uh, of months on the job have, have made them feel uh, that he's more competent than they initially thought. So where, what about these people that you met? What did they tell you? What was their greatest fear or concern about Donald Trump and what he might do to America? So their greatest fear wasn't so much about him, but more about the ways in which they were seeing the people who voted for him mm. respond to him. And look, the leader of the country, you can always put that in a vacuum and just say, well, I'll go on and live my life. But in the case of this couple that I, I ended up writing about, they felt like Donald Trump had given this green light to sort of change the way that others talked to one another, the way they dealt with one another, the way their social media feeds looked, the level of anger and animosity that you know neighbors had toward neighbors. So it was trickling down to their own life to, to the point where Trump might have been a catalyst for it, but all of a sudden um, they could feel sort of a veneer of civility ripped off the country and they, they felt like there was more racism, they felt like there was sort of an anti-intellectual regression going on in the country. And, uh, and they showed me, you know, over the course of several days I spent with them, how that manifested in their own lives. And they didn't like it. They were scared about it. And, and I don't think that they will likely move to Canada, but it was enough to make them dream of getting away. And, and my last question for you, when it comes to Cape Breton, I know you visited, do you think it's a place uh, for Americans to go who are feeling stressed out about the political scene there? Well, there are a bunch of reasons to go to Cape Breton uh, or anywhere in Canada just because the dollar, the exchange rate is so advantageous. <laughs> so I turned in my expense report from a week in Cape Breton and it was basically discounted 30%. But it's a beautiful place. Obviously, when you travel there in February or March, uh, it's cold and, and there's snow banks on, on the side of every road. But 
you don't have to imagine too hard what it looks like in June and July and August, uh, a, a paradise if you like, uh, you know, being on the water or having lobster or anything like that. So um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think people will go on vacation to escape Trump. I think. I think the the question about whether to move because you disagree with the politics of a place is a really serious question. Um, but uh, you know, there for for those who are really serious about it, there are honestly easier countries to get into than Canada. Canada's immigration system is pretty strict. <sighs> Chico Harlan, reporter with The Washington Post, thanks for speaking with us. And hey, by the way, congratulations to the uh, Pulitzer Prize winners at uh, your newspaper. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care.